The Supernatural Occurrences of Charles G. Finney. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Compiled by Daniel R. Jennings. Chapter 4. The Gift of Prophecy. Joel's prophecy of the coming of the Holy Spirit, which began to be fulfilled at Pentecost, indicated that the ministry of the Holy Spirit would include endowing men and women with a gift of prophecy. This is seen, for example, in the ministry of Agabus and the prophets of Antioch, Judas and Silas, the Ephesian converts, Philip's four daughters, Timothy, men and women in the Corinthian church, and John. Finney recorded several instances that appeared to be occurrences of the gift of prophecy. After reading them, one is left to ask, in what ways, if any, did Finney's experiences with the gift of prophecy differ from those described in the New Testament? Brother Nash's Prophecy I've said that there was a Baptist church and a Presbyterian, each having a meeting house standing upon the green, not far apart, and that the Baptist church had a pastor, but the Presbyterian had none. As soon as the revival broke out and attracted general attention, the Baptist brethren began to oppose it. They spoke against it and used very objectionable means indeed to arrest its progress. This encouraged a set of young men to join hand in hand to strengthen each other in opposition to the work. The Baptist church was quite influential, and the stand that they took greatly emboldened the opposition and seemed to give it a peculiar bitterness and strength as might be expected. Those young men seemed to stand like a bulwark in the way of the progress of the work. In this state of things, Brother Nash and myself, after consultation, made up our minds that that thing must be overcome by prayer, and that it could not be reached in any other way. We therefore retired to a grove and gave ourselves up to prayer until we prevailed, and we felt confident that no power which earth or hell could interpose would be allowed permanently to stop the revival. The next Sabbath, after preaching morning and afternoon myself, for I did the preaching altogether and Brother Nash gave himself up almost continually to prayer, we met at five o'clock in the church for a prayer meeting. The meeting house was filled. Near the close of the meeting, Brother Nash arose and addressed that company of young men who had joined hand in hand to resist the revival. I believe they were all there, and they sat braced up against the Spirit of God. It was too solemn for them, really, to make ridicule of what they heard and saw, and yet their brazen facedness and stiff neckness were apparent to everybody. Brother Nash addressed them very earnestly and pointed out the guilt and danger of the course they were taking. Toward the close of his address, he waxed exceeding warm and said to them, Now mark me, young men, God will break your ranks in less than one week, either by converting some of you or by sending some of you to hell. He will do this as certainly as the Lord is my God. He was standing where he brought his hand down on the top of the pew before him so as to make it thoroughly jar. He sat immediately down, dropped his head, and groaned with pain. The house was as still as death, and most of the people held down their heads. I could see that the young men were agitated. For myself, I regretted that Brother Nash had gone so far. He had committed himself that God would either take the life of some of them and send them to hell or convert some of them within a week. However, on Tuesday morning of the same week, the leader of these young men came to me in the greatest distress of mind. He was all prepared to submit, and as soon as I came to press him, he broke down like a child, confessed, and manifestly gave himself to Christ. Then he said, What shall I do, Mr. Finney? I replied, Go immediately to all your young companions, and pray with them, and exhort them, at once to turn to the Lord. He did so, and before the week was out, nearly, if not all, of that class of young men were hoping in Christ. A Prophecy Foretells a Woman's Healing and Conversion The Lord taught me, in those early days of my Christian experience, many very important truths in regard to the spirit of prayer. Not long after I was converted, a woman with whom I had boarded, though I did not board with her at this time, was taken very sick. She was not a Christian, but her husband was a professor of religion. He came into our office one evening, being a brother of Squire W., and said to me, My wife cannot live through the night. This seemed to plant an arrow, as it were, in my heart. It came upon me in the sense of a burden that crushed me, the nature of which I could not at all understand. But with it came an intense desire to pray for that woman. The burden was so great that I left the office almost immediately and went up to the meeting house to pray for her. There I struggled, but could not say much. I could only groan with groanings loud and deep. I stayed a considerable time in the church in the state of mind, but got no relief. I returned to the office, but could not sit still. I could only walk the room and agonize. I returned to the meeting house again and went through the same process of struggling. For a long time I tried to get my prayer before the Lord, but somehow words could not express it. I could only groan and weep without being able to express what I wanted in words. I returned to the office again and still found I was unable to rest. 
and I returned a third time to the meeting house. At this time the Lord gave me power to prevail. I was enabled to roll the burden upon him, and I obtained the assurance in my own mind that the woman would not die, and indeed that she would never die in her sins. I returned to the office. My mind was perfectly quiet, and I soon left and retired to rest. Early the next morning, the husband of this woman came in the office. I inquired how his wife was. He, smiling, said, She's alive, and to all appearance better this morning. I replied, Brother W., she will not die with this sickness. You may rely upon it, and she will never die in her sins. I do not know how I was made sure of this, but it was in some way made plain to me, so that I had no doubt that she would recover. She did recover, and soon after obtained a hope in Christ. The gift of prophecy leads to conviction. I recollect that one Sabbath morning, while I was preaching, I was describing the manner in which some men would oppose their families, and, if possible, prevent their being converted. I gave so vivid a description of a case of this kind that I said, Probably, if I were acquainted with you, I could call some of you by name, who treat your families in this manner. At this instant, a man cried out in the congregation, Name me, and then threw his head forward on the seat before him, and it was plain that he trembled with great emotion. It turned out that he was treating his family in this manner, and that morning had done the same things that I had named. He said his crying out, Name me, was so spontaneous and irresistible that he could not help it, but I fear he was never converted to Christ. Finney appears to prophetically foretell an animal's strange behavior. Soon after the adjournment of the convention, on the Sabbath, as I came out of the pulpit, a young lady by the name of S. from Stephantown was introduced to me. She asked me if I could not go up to their town and preach. I replied that my hands were full and that I did not see that I could. On the next Sabbath, Miss S. met me again as I came out of the pulpit and begged me to go up there and preach. Accordingly, the next Sabbath, after preaching the second time, one of the young converts at New Lebanon offered to take me up to Stephantown in his carriage. When he came in his buggy to take me, I asked him, Have you a steady horse? Oh, yes, he replied, perfectly so, and smiling asked, What made you ask the question? Because, I replied, if the Lord wants me to go to Stephantown, the devil will prevent it if he can, and if you have not a steady horse, he will try to make him kill me. He smiled, and we rode on, and strange to tell, before we got there, that horse ran away twice, and came near killing us. His owner expressed the greatest astonishment, and said he had never known such a thing before. A woman prophesies the coming revival. In the meantime, my own mind was much exercised in prayer, and I found that the spirit of prayer was prevailing, especially among the female members of the church. Mrs. B. and Mrs. H., the wives of two of the elders of the church, I found, were almost immediately greatly exercised in prayer. Each of them had families of unconverted children, and they laid hold in prayer with an earnestness that, to me, gave promise that their families must be converted. Mrs. H., however, was a woman of very feeble health, and had not ventured out much to any meeting for a long time. But as the day was pleasant, she was out at the prayer meeting to which I have alluded, and seemed to catch the inspiration of that meeting, and took it home with her. It was the next week, I think, that I called in at Mr. H.'s and found him pale and agitated. He said to me, Brother Finney, I think my wife will die. She is so exercised in her mind that she cannot rest day or night, but has given up entirely to prayer. She has been all the morning, said he, in her room, groaning and struggling in prayer, and I am afraid it will entirely overcome her strength. Hearing my voice in the sitting room, she came out from her bedroom, and upon her face was a most heavenly glow. Her countenance was lighted up with a hope and a joy that were plainly from heaven. She exclaimed, Brother Finney, the Lord has come. This work will spread over all this region. A cloud of mercy overhangs us all, and we shall see such a work of grace as we have never yet seen. Her husband looked surprised, confounded, and knew not what to say. It was new to him, but not to me. I had witnessed such scenes before, and believed that prayer had prevailed. Nay, I felt sure of it in my own soul. A Prophecy of a Coming Revival to Rochester, New York I have not said much, as yet, of the spirit of prayer that prevailed in this revival, which I must not omit to mention. When I was on my way to Rochester, as we passed through a village some thirty miles east of Rochester, a brother minister whom I knew, seeing me on the canal boat, jumped aboard to have a little conversation with me, intending to ride but a little way in return. He, however, became interested in conversation, and upon finding where I was going, he made up his mind to keep on and go with me to Rochester. We had been there but a few days when this minister became so convicted that he could not help weeping aloud. At one time, as he passed along the street, the Lord gave him a powerful spirit of prayer, and his heart was broken. As he and I prayed much together, I was struck with his faith in regard to what the Lord was going to do there. I recollect he would say, Lord, I do not know how it is, but I seem to know that thou art going to do a great work in this city. 
The spirit of prayer was poured out powerfully, so much so that some persons stayed away from the public services to pray, being unable to restrain their feelings under preaching. Footnote. Finney indicated in his memoirs that just as the brother had prophesied, the moral aspect of things was greatly changed by this revival. It was a young city full of thrift and enterprise and full of sin. The inhabitants were intelligent and enterprising in the highest degree, but as the revival swept through the town and converted the great mass of the most influential people, both men and women, the change in the order, sobriety, and morality of the city was wonderful. <laughs>